and Alex at Corum Deo Farm. We are a year three Oklahoma flower farm that sells retail market bouquets from our roadside flower stand. And today, my husband just yelled like and subscribe, like and subscribe. <laughs> but this video is gonna be all about ranunculus. So I'm sitting in our caterpillar tunnel we got from Farmer's Friend. We built it in October of last year. And this backdrop is so much nicer than just sitting in a cottage all winter talking to you guys about different topics. So I'm really excited to be in here. But I tried really hard to do this without glasses, but you guys, it's so bright right now. I have to put glasses on. I know it's breaking all of the like video YouTube rules, but I have to be able to survive. So here we are. It's like a glamour shot here amongst my ranunculus talking about ranunculus. I want to say up front, I'm not a ranunculus expert. This is my second year growing ranunculus. Last year I grew them in a smaller quantity to trial and then it went really well. And so we ordered a bunch more and here they are and it is going really, really well. So because on our channel, we're wanting to be open and honest about our experiences and our observations, I wanted to do a, a video about ranunculus and tell you how it's been going, things we've learned, opinions we have now, all of that. On our Facebook group that we manage, if you'd like to be a part of it, the link is below. The only requirement is that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, but you're welcome to join the group. I asked for ranunculus questions. I said, any and all questions accepted. What are your ranunculus questions? And I have them compiled. And so I'm just gonna go down the list here and talk what I know about ranunculus that is like a universal truth. And then some things that are just very specific to our experience. A lot of what I say will be very applicable if you live in a warmer climate. So colder places can grow ranunculus beautifully, no problem. The Midwest, the Pacific Northwest, the Northeast, you guys can all grow ranunculus. A lot of the stuff we talk about would still be applicable. But when we're talking about like maybe specific varieties or planting timing, that kind of stuff, I'm doing it in Oklahoma, which we're zone seven, but that doesn't give you information about our heat. That just tells you how cold we get, but we warm up really quickly. And so that presents challenges and what we're able to do, you know, with our ranunculus experiment. But let's dive in. I have a lot of questions. I think I included pretty much every single question I got because it covers everything I could think of that someone might ask about ranunculus. So grab, pause me and grab a notebook and pencil because it's gonna be one of those kind of videos, maybe one that like you go back and reference sort of video rather than a more artsy video, which we do sometimes more vlog style. But let's review a bit about what we have done here. So where I'm sitting. So it is in our high tunnel. We have a farmer's friend high tunnel that's like 90 feet, I think. And back in November, we filmed our whole process of planting ranunculus. So if you're a visual learner and you wanna see that, I'll link it in the description, watch it after, and you can see how we plant, pictures of all the varieties we chose, what our tunnel looks like, what our rows look like, what our irrigation looks like, all of that sort of stuff. But to review, we planted in our high tunnel in November. You could even look at the timestamp of the video because we're pretty on time with when our videos come out. I want to say it was like mid-November, like before Thanksgiving, if my memory serves correct, but the timestamp will be correct in that video. We planted 1,300 ranunculus, so that filled up a 80-foot, 3-foot wide bed and 200 corms fit I'm just looking at them here in front of me. 200 corms fit in our four foot bed in our second row because we couldn't totally fit everything in one row. So there's a little bit of spillover. We planted 800 elegance variety and we planted 500 almondine variety. So French and Italian ranunculus we planted. I planted them at six inches apart. Some people get a little closer to five, four inches. I'm glad I didn't do that because ours got huge with a ton of foliage growth. And so I think four inches would have actually had them 
tighter than is preferential, especially in a warmer climate. So I'm really happy with the six inch. I will do that again. The way I planted them at six inches is Eric prepped to the beds and we had the irrigation lines laid down. And then I took Hortanova netting. That's the white plastic netting we use to net our flowers. The, the snapdragons behind me are netted with them right now. And I laid it flat on the ground and that just created six inch cubes. And I just set a corm in each of the cubes and I set them all out. And then I like a typewriter, I went back to the end of the row and I planted all of them. So that's how I got a fairly accurate six inch spacing. And I said, when did we plant? So that's a review of what we've done. And now I'll start going through the questions of maybe the academic answer and then also like an experiential answer if it's relevant. So they, uh, someone asked, where do we buy our corms? So we bought our Amandine, Amandine, whatever, variety from Ball. And we bought our Elegance from Ownings. The different wholesalers, the primary ones tend to be Leo Burby, um, Ownings, and why am I forgetting? Oh, Ball. They kind of sell a little bit diff. There's a giant territorial bumblebee around. I'm sorry, I know this is your time to be in here, but give me an hour and I'll leave. Um, Leo tends to have a lot of the Tecalodi and the Romance series, uh, Ranculus. Ball tends to have a lot of the Amandine, but they, they carry others because Ball's the biggest. And then Ownings has the Elegance and then some of the very expensive like Colony and Success Ranunculus. And so because I wanted to try Amandine and um, Elegance to like compare and see if they're really, if I even noticed a difference, I ordered from both. Ball ended up sending, there's a great corm debacle, which the Lord providentially orchestrated to actually really benefit us because Ball sent our 500 corms to Maine and on accident, obviously. And I had a huge panic freak out <laughs> about that, thinking we weren't going to get the corms back. So then I went to Ownings and I ordered 800 and then we found the corms. And so we ended up with 1300. And my goodness, is, am I thankful because our year three has been banana pants. We've been selling out in an hour, hundreds of bouquets. And if we didn't have 1300 Nyninculus, it would have been tragic how few bouquets we would have had. So I'm really thankful for that, how that turned out. But the drama with Ball did freak me out a little bit about ordering from them in the future. But it is what it is. Um, are there any non-wholesalers that sell ranunculus? Yes. The problem when you go online to like, let's say an Eden Brothers or a Tulip World or a Holland Bulb Company, those are wholesalers that are like reselling retail online. And the problem with them is more often than not, you're just not going to get the right variety. You know, so you think you're buying some beautiful, pastel pink ranunculus and they come up like red and yellow. That's the problem. When you order from a wholesaler where you have a business account, yeah, variety mix-ups can happen, but they're more rare because that's their job. Their job is to make their wholesale clients happy. They're usually ordering in much larger quantities. They get it right. The big retail stores don't. So that's a big gamble. And if you're not yet at a, a place in your farm size to be ordering wholesale quantities, honestly, my recommendation is to not be growing ranunculus then on your farm. Because if you're not at that size yet, you're, you, that means you also don't have the customer base to sell those flowers to and to charge the price that ranunculus are worth to them. And so my advice would be to buy some of the cheaper retail ranunculus and practice growing them so you gain competency in growing the flower well. And then in a year or two, when your client base, your customers have increased to have a demand for ranunculus, you're then able to have a wholesale account and properly purchase wholesale corms and grow ranunculus for sale. That would be my advice not usually what people want to hear, but I'm kind of the no, the no channel, the no girl that I just, I would wait. I wouldn't do it. Did we pre-sprout? No, I did not pre-sprout. 
pre-spout, <laughs> whatever. I pre-soaked everything for about two hours. Sometimes I see advice online to soak like four to six plus hours, but you have to be careful because you can actually over soak your corms and you never want to get them so soaked that their little octopus legs start to break off. And so if you notice some of that breakage, they've been soaked too long. And so for me, the sweet spot was about two hours, two and a half hours to soak them in our buckets. Four hours, I think I would have had a ton of breakage. So just be mindful of that. But I soaked them, planted them, and then gave them a really deep irrigation water in and kept the soil moist until they had sprouted up above the ground. That was totally sufficient for me. I am unconvinced on why you need to pre-sprout for a fall planting because it's not, the soil's not too cold yet. It's at a happy temperature that they like. I can keep it moist with our drip tape at a consistent temperature in the tunnel. So I prefer to skip that labor step because it's trays, it's soil, it's still watering and monitoring and then you have to pull them out and then you have to plant them. I skipped all that, not worth it. I have no experience spring planting corms for some of you in colder climates. That might be, there might be more reasons to do that that I just don't have experience with. But for me, fall planting, I did not pre-sprout. My flower friend, Allison, who I've had on the channel, she grows about 45 minutes away from me. She doesn't pre-sprout. Another big grower in the area does not pre-sprout. We all kind of do the same thing and it works out well for us and so that's kind of an example of now that I think about it like really thinking about all of your steps and processes that you're doing on the farm and are you doing them because you saw Florette do it or are you doing it because that just seems to be what like Instagram does or have you really thought through like yes I need to do it this way because of X, Y, and Z, like the plant needs it, or my soil can't handle it, or the conditions, or whatever, and it's right for your farm versus, well, this is just how I've seen it done. And I actually save money by skipping the pre-sprout for the reasons I mentioned, and knowing what I should do on my farm with the flowers that I grow, and not just always kind of be in like copy and paste mode, you know, from what you see. Will we dig up, store, or rebuy? I am 100% not digging up and storing. We have already put in our ranunculus order. I'm sure in the future we'll make a video about what we decided to order and pictures and all of that fun stuff. The reason I'm not doing it, one, labor. I'm not interested in letting all of the foliage die back properly. One of the reasons for this is powdery mildew will start to set in. It will increase an attraction to bugs in here in the tunnel, which love tunnel conditions. And I have lisianthus planted. And in this row, this row next to me in the middle, I'm going to plant some fall annuals, the ones that can really handle the heat that the tunnel will get in the summer. And I don't want to have a full row of like aphid attracting decaying plants while I'm also trying to grow fresh, beautiful, new ones. So I, when we decide we're done, we're probably going to come through and sickle them down, get the debris out and cover with silage tarp. I haven't decided yet if I'm actually going to physically pull out the corms or not. Probably. Um, I have to think through maybe some pros and cons either way, but we're not going to save them largely because of labor. I'd still have to let it die back. I'd have to pull it up. I'd have to cut it. I'd have to let it dry and then I'd have to store it. And then I assume the gamble of, did I store it correctly? And when I go to plant them in the fall and I don't pre-sprout and I plant them in the ground and nothing happens, it's now November. Everything is almost sold out. And if I have to do a save my butt reorder, I'm left with like, the dregs of what's left in the inventory, and that's not a risk I want to take. Ranunculus are expensive, but as like a pie chart of expenses go on the farm, it's not our most expensive cost. And so the reduction in labor and the surety of having the varieties I want in good condition to be delivered to me next October is what I'm going to go for. But maybe if you grow on maybe a smaller scale number or you just feel really confident in your storing process and that works for you, you can definitely dig them up and store them properly and grow them again. That's a possibility. 
are someone asked are they a one and done or are they cut and come again they're not it's kind of like neither in a sense so they're not one and done like a tulip or a sunflower they're not cut and come again like a zinnia for example sorry guys i keep itching because there's i am having like phantom bugs touch me right now because i hear them all in the plastic but they're not cut and come again like a zinnia for example where you cut it and then where you cut it at that leaf node two new branches form and so if you keep cutting on it it'll keep going until it goes to seed they don't operate like that the stems are coming from soil level from the corms and the roots that are growing underneath and they're sending sending up largely a set amount of stems or flowers and that's what you're getting so kind of neither but you get multiple stems with ranunculus and also with anemones here next to me Someone asked, are the first stems short? Kind of like when you grow anemones, the first ones are like at soil level and you have a total freak out of like, what have I done wrong? I grew a three inch flower and then you cut on them and they keep getting longer. Ranunculus don't operate like that. Some of your early stems might be on the shorter end, but in general, they should be nice. I mean, I'm sitting here in a chair and this guy, is almost at short shoulder level. So this is at least a 24 inch stem if I cut him at ground level. Um, all of mine are really tall, so no, they shouldn't be really short. I've noticed they've gotten taller as they've grown, but I haven't had like a, a round of harvests where my stems were really short. They pretty much started at a bouquet wrap length. <laughs> See, I knew that was gonna happen a bouquet wrap length and have just gotten taller from there. Can you grow in the field or in pots or what is best? Yes, you can grow, well, zone depending. You can grow ranunculus in the field. My friend again, Allison at Sunshine and Stems, she doesn't have a high tunnel. She grows everything in low hoops. It's a ton of labor for her. She works really hard to take care of her babies all winter, but she does grow ranunculus in a field row with a low hoop. We both noticed, because we talk every day, that my ranunculus started blooming about two weeks before hers, even though we planted at like roughly, like basically the same week almost we planted. And that's probably due to more stressful field conditions and colder soil temps than what I have here. But she grew them just fine. I would say my foliage is a bit bigger and fluffier than hers, but she's still getting beautiful blooms. The stem length is acceptable, all of that. So if you're not in like a zone three, but you like don't have completely frozen solid soil and all of that, you can definitely grow them in a field. Or maybe I guess if you're in a really cold climate, you would do a spring planting anyways, which I'm not familiar with. So yes, you can grow them in the field. They will be different. Tunnel flowers are always better. Lysianthus are better in a tunnel. Snapdragons are better in a tunnel. It's just, that's why people have tunnels. But until you're able to invest in that on your farm, field is an option. For pots, personally, yeah, you could, but the efficiency would be really tricky. And I think ultimately kill profitability. I would kind of go back to the person asking about not ready for wholesale. If you can only grow in pots, I would say don't spend the money on, and the effort and labor on ranunculus because, I mean, unless you're growing like 30 pots worth, that's not really that many ranunculus that you're gonna get. And you'd have to fill 30 pots with soil and move them in and out constantly with freezing temps that I just don't know if it's worth it. Will the flowers grow? Yeah, probably if you kept them from freezing and you took care of them, but from a profitability standpoint, that's not something I would waste time on. Timing and different zones for planting. So again, I planted in November. Allison did an experiment where she planted most of hers in November and then a small second succession in January. Her, her November ones are blooming just like mine. Her January ones are just about to send up their first buds. So you could succession plant but for warmer climates, they need to be overwintered because our springs just heat up too quickly. Like it's going to be like 85 on Sunday. These flowers are about to be done. They are gonna be so angry with the future extended temperatures that ranunculus season is almost over. So if I had planted in like February, when a lot of the like cooler places are planting their ranunculus, I never would see this. 
so that's the timing if you're in a cooler place honestly the best advice i can give is like follow a competent beautiful flower farm in your general region and kind of watch what they do and take notes of their timing because like if you're in michigan follow a couple big Michigan flower farms and pay attention to when they seem to be planting their ranunculus or talking about ranunculus. That'll give you a good indication for your particular microclimate when your timing for certain things should be. I mean, that's how I learned about planting mid-November is I observed what was happening in some of the farms around me that were successful. I just answered this one technically. What temperature range are ranunculus most happy? So if ranunculus could grow between like 40 and 60 degrees like the 40s through the 60s they would be super happy so they're not freezing but they're not getting too warm they're just kind of in that like perfect cool gentle spring they would be the most happy so it's basically the opposite of Oklahoma because Oklahoma is like super cold January and February March is like neurotically all over the place and then April like we've got an 85 and an 89 coming next week in April. Like we basically don't even do spring. So ranunculus don't love Oklahoma, but we're making it work as best we can. Then someone asked, when do you cover the ranunculus? Oh, the bees are back. Go away. They're fighting. This is my tunnel. It's not even your tunnel. Go away. When do you cover? Okay, so whenever the temperatures were gonna be under 30, we would close the tunnel, and then we would low tunnel the ranunculus. So we had, yes, we had low tunnels inside a high tunnel. High tunnels actually can get colder than the outside. There's a whole science thing. Eric tried to explain it to me. That's not my strong suit. But basically, you're closing the tunnel and then you're low tunneling. And what that does is it's trapping the soil temperature heat that you've accumulated. And as that heat is being released, it's being tra trapped by that low tunnel inside the tunnel to keep the ambient temperature in your little cocoon warm. And so that's what we did and it worked great. Ranunculus are hardy down to like 25. Sometimes there's stories of even colder Probably not if it was like sustained all night, but you know, a couple hours it dipped down to 20 and things were fine. I just preferred like when it was gonna be under 30 that we just had a routine of that's what we did. And then when it was above freezing, so like it's gonna be 34 that day, the, the covers came off. I wanted to have really good airflow all the time. So the low tunnels came off, the sides and ends of the tunnel came up and they had that cool winter breeze, fresh air. And then around like 3 p.m., 4 p.m., we would close and let things kind of get warmer in here. And then that would trap and release during the, during the um, night and keep it a bit toastier at the root level. Because what's the biggest thing is sometimes you can get top growth damage so like foliage damage but the roots under the soil are still alive and so they'll push new growth if the soil gets so cold that the roots are damaged then you're in big trouble and so that's what you're wanting to avoid with the low tunnel under the high tunnel okay next group of questions stick with me guys there's a lot of information <laughs> The next question is the question I hate getting the most, and that's about pest management. The reason I hate it is it's just so darn hard to answer. There isn't some like one size fits all, spray this and you never see an aphid again sort of situation. If that were the case, it wouldn't be a hard question to answer and we all wouldn't be asking it constantly. Um, Yes, we have had some aphids and some thrips. There's a section behind me that's like extra pink, which it shouldn't because it shouldn't be super colorful because I should be harvesting a lot. But there's a section, small section, maybe like 50 corm, 70 section that has aphids. It's not like a horrifying infestation, but it's enough that I don't want to cut and sell them. We have sprayed pyrethrin and while it hasn't completely killed them, 
it's at least remained manageable to the point that I don't see it spreading. And that's just how it is. I mean, that unfortunately, that's the best answer I can give. If you are an ASCFG member, they have tons of resources on pest management. There's some other Facebook groups you can join for people that like really get into the technicalities of integrated pest management and all of that that would be way more qualified to answer than me. We tend to stick in the pyrethrin family and spray as we observe and need to, but also try to default to less spray if we can avoid it. Cause like you said, I'm being like dived bomb by bees. And if I like gassed my tunnel, that wouldn't be the case. And so if there was a major infestation, I would have done more research and kicked it up a notch on getting it under control. But because it was a small section and I'm not seeing any spread, that's just farming, I feel like. It's, if it's not like crop loss or major damage, I'm not fussing too much. And so pyrethrin is what we have used and it's working-ish. Someone asked about powdery mildew. Yeah, they can definitely get powdery mildew. I have a little section where I'm seeing a little bit of evidence, but it's not damaging the plants enough that I think it's affecting vase life, so I haven't sprayed, but that just would be a situation where you would spray a fungicide. Um, once powdery mildew really gets going, it's hard to stop. So at the first signs is you, when you wanna spray or you wanna do like a preventative spray if you know you live in a place where powdery mildew is just really common, say it's pretty hot, humid, moist spring area, you could have been doing preventative to help it really get going. Um, but that's, you know, powdery mildew just kind of also ha just happens. Someone asked, what causes yellowing leaves in the ranunculus and can that be avoided? That's a great question. I don't know if it can be avoided because I don't t totally know what causes it, but all of mine have it. And so because I have beautiful flowers, a ton of stems, healthy plants, I'm taking it as it's not a problem for me to solve. You know, yellowing leaves can always be like, not enough water or too much water, goodbye. Not enough water, too much water. I don't, uh, stop it. I have been a friend. Don't push your luck. Ooh. Eric's gonna edit all of this out. He's gonna love this. Oh yeah, okay. So I'm looking right now and I can see yellow leaves underneath the main healthy leaves. That's also making me not get involved too much because the, the new growth, the top growth is all really healthy. It doesn't seem to be hurting, hurting the plants too much. So I'm not too fussed about it. If my plants were really small and also getting yellow, I'm seeing like orange eggs here. I'll have to investigate that later then I would look into it further. But it also just might be what happens because it's all the base leaves and those are gonna be the oldest leaves. And so that just might be what happens. Kind of like with the sunflower, the original leaves kind of start to yellow as the bigger ones get going. So it just might be an age cycle thing and not actually something you're doing wrong. But because my plants are healthy and happy, the yellowing is not causing problems. So um, that's where I'm at with that. Someone's asking why their stems are short and their blooms are small. I can't really diagnose um, that. My theories would be ranunculus are very, very thirsty plants, kind of like with tulips, where if in their vegetative stage they're not getting enough water, then they're probably going to be stunted. And when they're stunted, they tend to just like shoot up a, like a half ass bloom that's like short and a smaller bloom size because they're just, they didn't get enough water to really fluff out. So that could be a problem. They could have gotten just too cold and so they were too stressed. On the opposite end of the spectrum, that you could just be in too warm of a place and you didn't plant them soon enough, like I did in November, where it's getting so hot that they're like, well, this is all I can give you. And they give you a short stem and a short bloom because it's just really warming up. Those would be my theories, is water and then a plant timing issue. It also could be variety. You know, some varieties are just short. Some varieties are just smaller. Like I planted Amandine Black and it's a disaster. And I know it's a variety issue because 
I have a controlled experiment of a bunch of other ranunculus in the exact same conditions, and they didn't do that. Not gonna grow that variety again, but that was a variety thing that I didn't know. And so you also might wanna look into that if you don't know, kind of do like a process of elimination situation to diagnose like where, what issue you think you might be having in that situation. How long from plant to bloom? So you'd have to do the math on the calendar, but again, I planted mid-November and my first blooms that I started cutting were like the third week of March. So we're in like week three, heading into four with our ranunculus. So from November to March. That timeline is shorter when you have a spring planting because the temperatures are warmer. The plants are spending less time in a dormant stage. And typically in the spring plantings, it's more of like a 90 day window, but I don't have direct experience with that again because I can never do a spring planting. Fertilizing. Yes, I fertilized once the plants started putting on active green growing growth. I fertilized every other week with Neptune's Harvest fish and seaweed emulsion. I have a backpack sprayer and I sprayed them every other week, like pretty much all of January, February, and early March. And then when they started putting up their blooms and stuff, I stopped. Did we use shade cloth? Yes, we have shade cloth right now. And that's the only reason I could be in here. It would be like a 90 degree tunnel if we didn't have it on. We put it on in mid-March because it just gets so much hotter in a tunnel, especially with the sun. Like there's not even clouds out today. So without the shade cloth, this tunnel would be into the 90s. And so ours went up in March. I think if you're doing a low tunnel situation too, you would also want to use a shade cloth um, if your temperatures are warm. What will we plant after? So I kind of already answered this. I realized this bed next to me is just going to get terminated and shut down with a silage tarp to not grow any new fun summer weeds so that we can plant again in the fall. And then the middle row is going to be planted with marigold, basil, and celosia in early June as kind of like my third succession plant from my field crop plan but we're not gonna use the full row. So whatever's not planted, will also get a silage tarp. And then in the third row, I have lizzies. And once the lizzies are done at the end of July, it'll meet the same fate as the ranunculus. It'll get chopped down and silage tarped to rest and solarize until um, fall planting, which again will be November of next year, or this year, duh, in the fall. Um, how long do they produce? So this is definitely going to be climate temperature dependent. I would guess in the Midwest, you get a little bit longer window because they're not as temperature stressed. But for us, it seems like I can expect four weeks of ranunculus. And maybe if I try the succession plant, I could get another week and push it to five weeks. But beyond that is gonna to be too much of a challenge because our early March is not warm enough and our later April is too hot. So it's just gonna to have to be a very fast and furious, crazy month of ranunculus, which is also how our tulips perform. We do not have a long tulip season. Our tulip season is like three weeks max. I suspect when our peonies start to go, it's gonna be the same thing because we just get so darn hot. The spring flowers just develop so quickly and then they're done. Succession planting, I talked about that. I'm gonna trial doing a smaller batch of succession planting next year, but a majority is all gonna go in at the same time. And then a fall harvest. So some people have planted ranunculus like end of summer, and then they get a fall harvest. There's no scenario that that would work for us because we are still in the 90s in September. And then much like in spring where we like to go from extreme to extreme, we basically skip fall and we go from like 90 degree Septembers to like in the 20s sometimes in October with hard freezes and cold. And so I just don't think that there's enough of a window where the ranunculus could grow, not in extreme temperatures and bloom, not in intense, like not intense heat growth and then bloom, not in intense cold. It just wouldn't be possible. But you'd have to think about what your summers and your falls look like if a fall planting would be possible. I haven't heard that being very common, even from bigger farms located all over the country. That doesn't seem to be a common practice, which 
tells me it's not the most successful. So I'm not super interested in it. All right, we're in our last section, guys, our last section. Probably the one everyone wants to know because everyone wants to talk about specific flowers and I get it, that's the pretty part. But we were asked what varieties bloomed first and most prolific. So the first real blooms were Amandine Barbie and Amandine Orange. I suspect that is less to do with their specific variety and more to do with their planting location because they're the ones that are in the middle. And so they had the least amount of environmental stress because the ranunculus on the side of the tunnel still had cold drafts and they got colder so these guys put on like the most foliage growth and they were the fluffiest and most happy. And so it makes sense to me that they bloomed earlier. But in this row, elegance, oh geez, this is another language issue. It's G-I-A-L-L-O. And it's Italian and I know Spanish, not Italian. So what would G-I-A-L-L-O be? Giallo? giallo but it's a yellow it's absolutely beautiful it was one of eric's favorite he chooses between that and a elegance orange that were his favorite but that one bloomed first in this in this first row next to the sides the most prolific actually i can't tell i feel like it is fairly even between the amandine and the ranunculus and between the colors technically again i think maybe the amandine barbie but it's not a perfect comparison because again it's in the like the middle baby happy row i'm looking here yeah i don't think that there was a clear winner from a volume perspective i've been really happy with all of the varieties except for amandine black which is just a complete fail right off i didn't even really cut on it the rest all seem fairly, fairly similar. What types to grow for best profitability? Um, so there's a spectrum of cost of the corm. And so on the cheapest end, you have like the Tecalodi, and then you'd have Amandine, Elegance, Romance, and then like su Success Colony kind of in that range because those are the tissue cultured ones that are patent protected and so you're talking like a dollar fifty two dollars a corm even even higher for some of those and so profitability is going to be a budget and a customer question i would never try to sell some of the more expensive corms to a retail customer in our roadside stand environment because they're not going to be discerning enough and this isn't a criticism of them, on them it's just a knowledge thing it's like they're not going to understand why that ranunculus is five, four, five dollars a stem and not two fifty three dollars and that's because it's, you know, it's a tissue culture from Italy and blah blah blah. That doesn't work. But if you are a high-end wholesale grower to event florists in Philadelphia who want like the biggest, most perfect ranunculus that can be grown locally, then that kind of decision can be profitable because they're willing to pay what it's worth and so you have to make that decision based on your customers first you have to make that decision based on your budget but personally i think the tecalodi is not really worth it because they tend to throw up a lot more single blooms which are the ones where you can see like the open black face really easily and they only tend to have a couple layered ruffles which i mean it's a fine flower but it's not really what people think with ranunculus i would kind of like take that one out and so in the like retail space what you see grown is amandine and elegance they have a little bit of a different in cost and they also have a little bit of a different like color range to choose from but you're going to be picking from that from a wholesaler i again think that if you do not have a big or growing customer base that you should hold off on ranunculus even though they're absolutely beautiful um, because they're a more expensive cost than like growing flowers from seed they are very high labor and they're really easy to screw up so they have, they have a higher risk and you need to have customers that are willing to pay you 
for what that value is, which again is like $2.50, $3. Some people even do $3.50 closer to $4 for a stem. And if your customers are like the $1.50, $2 people and you don't have a lot of them because you're new, don't do this yet. Grow it in your personal garden or grow a small bag to practice. But like remove that stress of feeling like, well, I have to grow this flower because it's on some like mythical to be a real flower farmer, you have to grow these flowers sort of thing and just exercise more patience in your buildup of your farm. Because again, this is year three and it's the first year we're selling ranunculus. I would not have done this in year one or two and I'm glad I didn't. How many stems did each plant produce? Well, each plant produced a ton of stems. Right now, I'm looking at an average of four to six cuts of sellable stems per plant. More closer probably to the four than the six, but I'm probably getting about four, about four per plant that get to the like sellable stage because we have high standards. If I miss something and it blows out, like I'm not gonna cut it, it's a loss, or if it's funky shaped, or if like now as they're winding down, they're sending up really small buds or really thin stems. I'm not cutting some of those because they're just so dinky. I'm, I'm not really interested in that. So cuttable stems, I'm at about the four, five if I'm really, really doing well. When we go to make our planting projections and revenue projections for next year, I think we're gonna operate at the four number to be conservative. A lot of times you hear five to seven, often that's in cooler climates where the plants are probably producing for a longer period of time under less stressed conditions than I give them. And so I think four, five being lucky is realistic for where I grow. And that might be different for you, again, depending if you have longer, cooler springs, you might be able to get closer to that six, seven mark, but that's not where we're at. But four or five stems times a thousand, you know, that's 4,000 ranunculus at, you know, $3 a piece sort of thing. That's still enough to make me really, really happy with them being a good choice for us to grow. Favorite varieties, favorite varieties. Okay, this is obviously like the big question. Um, I liked them all, except for the Amandine Black. I liked them all that I chose. Again, if you wanna chose, see everything that we grew, watch that November video. I would say my personal favorite from a color palette standpoint is I liked the Elegance Dulce Vita Pastel Mix, which is right next to me. It's like a, it's like a, like a, cream to Barbie pink spectrum. I'm looking at them right now and there's some like creamy whites, there's some baby pink, there's some like salmon-y ruffle, there's some Barbie pink. I love the mix. They've produced a ton of stems. They're healthy. I just really enjoyed having them. I, the color palette is just kind of what I think of when I think of ranunculus. So I really enjoyed them. I've ordered them again for sure. Eric loved the elegance orange and yellow ones that I grew and I ordered those again as well. They just were really striking in their bold saturated color. They were super ruffly so they just looked incredible when people looked at them. The ones that got the most attention on social media posts that I made for my customers were the elegance viola which is a super dark like it's not a red wine because it has a purple blue undertone, not a red undertone in its darkness. So it's like a, like the deepest, deepest grape almost. That was, the, I'll have Eric put a picture on the screen for that one because I took a great picture of it. People remarked on that one the most. I think perhaps because it's the most unique that maybe they haven't seen before because ranunculus tends to be more in like the pastel family. My customers also tend to like the darker, bolder colors. So I'm not surprised that they really had an interest in that, but that one was very popular on the so social media standpoint. Best variety and color for a beginner. Like if you only could grow like one, for example, like my budget has one. 
I would do like an elegance or an almondine pink, like anything in the pink family, because that to me is just the most classic ranunculus. It screams ranunculus, it'll be ruffly, it'll be beautiful, you'll have great pictures. Customers will love it and it's pink, so it'll go with any of the other pastel spring flowers that you maybe have blooming at the same time, like say a snapdragon, or if you have any tulips still going, I would just pick a pink elegance or almondine to go with. I just don't think you can go wrong with the pinks in spring. Harvest stage. So the thing I love about ranunculus is they're way more forgiving in the harvest stage than say like a peony or a tulip, where if you miss the window and they blow out, like you can't really store them that long or you're in more trouble. Ranunculus give you a bit of a spectrum but there's kind of a decision you have to make. So what they say is you wanna harvest the ranunculus when it's soft like a marshmallow, not like a hard tight ball, but it started to like soften and the green, the green petals kind of cupping the color are loosened a bit, you know, they're not as like vice gripped around the bud. That is a great harvest stage for the cooler. Now, sometimes when you harvest at that stage, it means the flower isn't going to fully open up to its max. That doesn't mean it's not gonna open anymore, but it might, might not fully open to its max versus letting one open a bit more and harvesting at that stage. I've done both. I tend to default a little bit to the more open because I'm using our flowers fairly quickly. At this point, the longest amount of time spent in a cooler is maybe 10 days. So I'm not pushing that like three week mark that some of them can hit. If I was trying to do a longer term storage like that, kind of like with tulips harvesting at color crack stage, I would wanna harvest at that more marshmallow stage for longer term storage. But like, for example, after I film this, I'm gonna go harvest and these are gonna go in the cooler for probably next Saturday. So that's like six, seven days, seven days. I have more flexibility in letting them be open a bit more. If they've opened so much that you can see the black center or the outer petals are just like really wide open, you're not, they're not gonna die in the cooler, but when you pull them out and you give them to a customer, the vase life is going to be a bit shorter. But I've taken, like we had one bouquet that had like people get really rough in manhandling the bouquets in the stands. So there was one bouquet. I made 93, we sold 92 because there was one that had a couple stems where they got the buds got cracked, they got broken. I didn't want to sell that. So I took it inside, I put it in a vase. The ranunculus still look absolutely incredible. And they're heading into day seven. They're on day seven now, and they look amazing. And so I think if you can get seven days and beyond that a customer should be really, really happy about that. But the ranunculus have the opportunity to be more like 10, 12 days, you know, depending on that, that harvest stage. But I think if you've hit seven, a customer should be really, really happy with that. So then you've harvest them at, at marshmallow or a bit open. If they're going in the cooler, in my harvest bucket, I use a conditioning uh, solution. I'll have Eric put it on the screen because I can't remember the exact name, but the brand is Crystal, and it's like a holding and hydrating solution. It basically helps keep them really hydrated while they sit in the cooler that gives them better flower life. It's what florists tend to use in their, in their holding displays and in their coolers. I just got the big thing from their website with a pump and I just do like a pump splash, stop it, pump splash in the bucket and like two, three inches of water, I harvest straight into it and then it goes just straight into the cooler and that's my process. I don't do any other solutions like in the buckets in the flower stand and stuff, but if it's a bucket that's going from the field into the cooler, it has that holding solution. I'm doing it because I just see that practice used a lot in the bigger farms that I try to emulate or just learn from, but I don't have like a direct a and B comparison of using it and not, but it wasn't that expensive. It was a huge thing. So like, I'm gonna have more than enough all season. I'm probably just gonna use it for everything I do since it can help with just hydrating the plants once you cut them, get them slurping up that water right away. 
and it's been going well. I haven't had any um, conditioning issues. I haven't had any wilting or, or problems, so it's not doing anything bad. <laughs> But I tend to default to not to use a lot of stuff, but because we're now growing fussier flowers that can be held longer in storage, I kind of stepped my game up a little bit from like last year where I didn't do anything with my zinnias and my marigolds and you know, whatever, because they're not going in a cooler and I'm not holding them for that long. So that's what I've been doing. Ooh, we gotta turn the page guys. That means we're almost done. Uh, stem price, woo. Let's talk about stem price here. Ours is about, I wanna say like 275 when I go to make our bouquet formulas, give or take. But it's worth talking about the concept of grading. And if you watched our interview that I did with Ellen Frost, who is a florist, I have, I'll link it because you have to watch it. Even if you don't sell wholesale, it's a, she's just, it's really neat getting a perspective of someone who's buying our flowers than just always the farmer perspective. And she talked about grading and how her farmers give her graded prices based on the quality of that flower. You know, the size, the stem length, the straightness, all of that, she's getting a grade of pricing. And I think that should be the same in the retail world when you're looking at your own flowers because there are some ranunculus, like my first couple flushes, my first like two or three harvests from the ranunculus where like the ranunculus were like three, four inches across even. They just were like, you could put them in a magazine perfect. And now as the plants are getting more stressed and it's getting hotter, they're sending up smaller blooms and so I need to reflect that in how I'm putting the bouquets together. Because if I was just doing a straight, like this is a ranunculus, so it's 275, no matter what, my customers are gonna get very different perceived value out of their bouquets. Because like the bouquets this week would be smaller feeling if I didn't do that sort of graded pricing. Now I know that it still cost me the same amount but it's not just about your labor and your cost that gives something value. There's also the perceived value to the customer. And like Ellen talks about how she pays very different prices for a first flush of ranunculus versus second flush of ranunculus because the qualities are very different. The size of the, the bloom, the stem thickness and height are different. The weightiness that it looks like in a bouquet is different. And so, for me to just say any ranunculus that you grow that comes out of your field should be at least $2.50. I can't really say that because you have to factor in quality of your flower. And like an 18 inch first or second flush ranunculus of the season that's just like Instagram epic, that's gonna look way different in a bouquet than like end of season, last week of life, ranunculus. We're like, I'm not gonna put an ugly or a damaged or a terrible flower in the bouquet, but if it's objectively thinner or the bud is just never gonna get quite as big, I'm gonna have to adjust my recipe and my price point up a bit to reflect that and because that's what the customers are also going to be wanting and to notice. So 275, it'll probably get bumped down to more of the $2 range when I make the bouquets next week end, which will probably be the end of our ranunculus. And so we'll go from like nine stems in a recipe to probably more like 11. You know, so I'm not talking about a huge range, but it's like adding those like two more stems puts a little bit more of that weight back into the bouquet that they felt two weeks ago when everything was just like at its most epic size. And so the last questions were about bouquet recipe and how many are in our bouquets. So we sell a $25 bouquet and it was about nine stems of ranunculus and some anemones at times were in that. It's probably gonna go to 11 um, next weekend, I said, and kind of make the, the, that minor adjustment. But I do straight bunches. I don't waste time and field space and stuff on a bunch of filler. Everyone has different philosophical decisions. Ooh, God, that was the closest. Ugh. They have people, everyone has their opinion on filler. I'm kind of a low filler girl. 
I don't waste space and time and effort and all of that. And I get zero complaints from our customers. They're coming to the flower stand for ranunculus, not Orlea. That's what they're getting. I'm not overstuffing my bouquets because if I grew no filler and I overstuffed, then I would 100% not be profitable. But I'm putting in a profitable amount of stems at my price point that I can get away with not putting filler in, which is exactly what it is. It fills the bouquet out and stuff, but I'm just, I'm not overstuffing and the customers are getting a, a valuable, beautiful spring bouquet that also makes me money. So don't overstuff your bouquets. I don't care what you say. It's not profitable. And last question, did we notice certain colors selling out faster? I can't say yes or no, mainly because I give everyone a mix. And so I'll put a picture on the screen here of what our bouquets have looked like. And you don't get every color in the bouquet, but you're getting at least three colors. And so it would be hard to say like, well, the ones with pink sold out quicker because almost every bouquet had pink, for example, or had like one orange in it. So I can't really say. Um, people did point out the viola, that was that dark one again. And I think they liked the mix. Eric said he heard a couple people at the stand last week kind of make commentary that they wish there was like an all pink one, you know, for example. And in general, I'm not interested in making like very color palette specific tonal bouquets because I lose a lot of efficiency that way. But I am gonna experiment I know you guys are loving this B saga, Alex versus B. I am gonna experiment putting together some bouquets that are like all in the like pink and cream or maybe put together some like dominant orangey yellows together, that sort of thing, and see if I noticed anything. But honestly, we're selling so many, which is incredible. And our customers just really love getting those focal flowers in bright cheery colors that I don't think I'm gonna be making a ton of adjustments or changes to what we're doing in a mix moving forward. But that is customer observation. Your customers might be totally different. Your customers might be like, the ones where I do a specific monochromatic look sell out faster than my mixed bunches or vice versa. You should be observing that. And if you notice trends, you should definitely adjust to give your customers what they want. And since I'm sensing a vast majority want mixed colors, they're getting mixed colors and it works out for me because it's easier for me and more efficient. And so that's, that's what we're going with. But I hope that this answered all your ranunculus questions more or less. It definitely, I accumulated a lot of them and I hope this was helpful. I hope it's a good reference point for you when maybe in the fall you're going to plant ranunculus and you wanna look back at all of this and stuff, or you're going to order your ranunculus corms now, which you should be doing. If you're gonna order from a wholesale, you should get your order together. Um, and that's that. It's pretty hot right now, so I don't think I'm gonna harvest right away, but this evening I'm gonna come through and do a cut. I think I probably have a bucket and a half to fill in here. And then tonight I'm gonna make bouquets for tomorrow. I think my goal tonight is maybe 50 bouquets and then 30 or 40 in the morning for hopefully a 90 bouquet ranunculus Saturday flower stand. So hopefully this was helpful. Thank you for watching. Subscribe, like, share, all those fun things. We're grateful you're here and you're watching and I'll see you in the next video. Woo! Stupid bees.